Indeed, remember the, one, the first thing we always said that leadership is influence. No matter where you are in your life, your home, your family, your community, your church, whatever it is, we hold a place of influence. We're supposed to make a difference in the world around us. But once we have that place of influence and we're exercising influence, how do you, how do you keep your testimony? How do you stay above board? How do you stay you know, reliable and righteous in your walk and in the leadership that God has blessed you with and designated you with? So as we look at this today, we're, going, we're looking at Nehemiah chapter 5, and we're looking at verses uh, 14 through 19 today, all right? He says, moreover... From the day that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 30th, second year of Artaxerxes, for 12 years, neither I or my kinsmen have taken or have eaten the governor's food allowance. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them their bread and their wine, and besides 40 shekels of silver, even their servants domineered the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God." And I also supplied myself, applied myself to the work and we did not buy my, any land and all my servants were gathered there for the work. In other words, I didn't take advantage nor did let my servants take advantage. Moreover, there were at my table 150 Jews and officials besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. And now that which was prepared for each day was an ox and choice sheep and birds or poultry. They were also prepared for me and came into me and, and, and in 10 days, uh, all sorts of wine every 10 days were furnished in abundance. Yet for all this, I didn't demand the governor's food allowance because the servitude was heavy on the people. Remember my God, oh my God, for the good according to all that I have done for this people. You see a guy here, he's in leadership over the people and you see him thinking about his actions, his attitudes, how he responds, how he works with people, and how he resolves the problems that are there. Last week, Tim did a great job in dealing with how you deal with internal problems. Some of that pours over into the character again that you see in Nehemiah's life. Things are getting better. He's been there now for quite a period of time as he talks about the testimony of how the wall was built. And he's talked about now we've gone for that period of 52 days where he's kind of given over you. I'm there for 12 years. I did this for 12 years as I, as, as I was the governor. And here's how I handled the affairs. Things have begun to happen. Blessings have begun to occur. Uh, the bounty has happened. People are getting, you know, the burdens are being relieved and people's blessings are coming. But he's not taking advantage of anything that comes on. He knows how to handle the blessings. He knows how to handle the prosperity. Not a lot of people do. In fact, you just kind of take a quick run back of all the lotto winners for the last 15 years. They're all in stark poverty today. Even though some of them got millions upon millions of dollars, they don't have anything to show for it. All right? They didn't have anything to show for it because it's all gone and they didn't know how to handle all that prosperity that came their way. It was Thomas Carlyle who said, for every 100 people who can handle adversity, there's only one who can handle prosperity. It's one thing to, to have blessings and to handle the blessings and to receive the blessings of God. It's another thing to know how to deal with those blessings. The scripture makes it very clear. Even as Christians, as we mature and as we grow in grace, you know, and as we advance in, 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 our, in our walk with God, that we ought to be careful Remember that passage, beware, you know, when you, when you stand, take heed lest you fall. That's an important part of the Christian life that we remember. There's three areas that leaders are tempted in, in regard to. There, there's three things that are really advantages where the temptations come from. The three advantages of leadership are one, position, which means you can become more. You have an opportunity to become more. Two is power. You can do more when you're in authority. And three is privilege. You can have more when you're in authority. They experience more. But those same three areas of leadership and blessing are the same three areas these benefits are where people are tempted, all right, where they experience great temptations. With every one of these, power, position, privilege, whatever it is, every one of those, there's different kind of temptations that can be, that appeal to in your life. So we have to do as scripture says. We have to stand firm. We need to take heed lest we fall. So when you think you're standing, don't think you've arrived, beware. Be on guard. When the blessings are there, don't take your eyes off, uh, and, uh, off, off the, the, the attitude of being a guardian about your life and being aware of what's going on in your life. And a lot of people do. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at these privileges and see how that those privileges can ultimately become temptations in, the, in regard to your spiritual walk in life. Now, the background is, as I said a little while ago, Nehemiah has been on, on, the, on, the, on premise for about 12 years, all right? He identifies what's going on. He's seen very clearly the the attitude of those who came before him. He's seen the abuses of the people that came before him. He not only saw the governors abuse their privilege they had, he also talks about how their servants and their associates misused and abused the privileges that they had. And if you follow the story carefully, he said, I didn't do those things. 
What are the temptations of leadership? Well, they, they come out of those, those areas right there. So if we're going to be leaders, if we're going to be influencers, and may I reiterate, every one of us are to be. Every one of us have been called to influence. Every one of us have a leadership role in life. Sometimes in our family, sometimes in our job. It's, if nothing else, learn how to lead yourself and have integrity of soul and spirit and heart. Have disciplines in your life. He said, these are the leadership blessings, but with those blessings come the leadership temptations. The first temptation is you will be tempted to misuse and abuse your positions. He talks about the other, uh, other governors, as I mentioned, how they laid a heavy burden on the people. And not only did they lay a heavy burden on them, how they taxed them. And they wanted, took 40 shekels of silver for them in addition to taking their food and their wine. Unrealistic demands, demanding people. These people were hard on the people that they were supposed to be helping and the people they were supposed to be serving. It's just the opposite. They would fit perfectly into the political power structure in America today. What is this going to do for me? What can I get out of this? How is this going to benefit me? When I leave this office, how much will I have to take with me when I'm out of here? We see it over and over and over again in the world around us. And it's not just in America. It's, it's, it's in it's in corporate America. It's all over the world. You see it. Third world countries. You see it. When people get to power in a place of position, they have a tendency to always abuse that and misuse that position for themselves. I mean, how many of you have ever worked with somebody who wasn't ready for advancement and was advanced, you know, and they were advanced to a place and all of a sudden they were the nicest guy in the world to work with, but now they became the dictator. Now they became the Lord of the universe simply over the supply closet at work. <laughs> you can't have a pencil today. You had two pencils this week. You know that guy. Well, he'd been given a position and now he's going to use that position. And many times they misuse the position. They become, you know, destructive. They become demeaning. They become demanding. They always want what they want. You have to be cautious whenever you're blessed with a place of, and a position of authority in your life and a place of authority in your life, you have to be cautious because Satan is going to come against you and get you to be selfish in that instead of realizing that we're not to be selfish, we're to be servants for the Lord Jesus Christ. The second temptation of leadership has to do, first of all, with, with our position, the second of all, with power. Remember, these are privileges, but they also become temptations. You'll be tempted to abuse the power you've been, you've been given. He said, even my associates, the people who worked with me, even they become demeaning to the people. It was an autocratic style of, of worship, you know, of, of leadership style. It was unappreciated. The people, they, they, they felt depressed. And because of depression, they felt depressed and that nothing's getting done. In fact, we saw that for all those years when Nehemiah, before Nehemiah got to the wall, how many efforts had been made to build that wall and nothing had ever succeeded before and nothing was going to succeed. In fact, there is a leadership law. It says this, that leadership is not lordship. Jesus said, if you're going to be the master, you have to be the servant. But that concept is lost in the world today. We think to become a master and a leader over a place is a means by where we can get more and have more for ourselves and somehow feather our own nest to make ourselves more comfortable in the world. So here they are. There's a difference between being a boss and being a leader. There's a difference between being in charge of something and really being what the, the biblical concept of what a, really, a, a leader really is. The third thing is that you'll be tempted to profit from your privileges. He said twice, you know, in this passage, he talks about a food allowance that the governors had. And he said, I didn't take it. In other words, there was an apparent amount of food within the territories that belonged to the governor. Notice in Nehemiah, it says in verse 15, I did not take that. He said in verse 14, I was a governor there for 12 years and I did not take that. I could have taken it. You know, I had, it, it was on the list, you know, of, of my, uh, it was in the pay package. <laughs> You know, it was part of the expense package. I could have done it, but he said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And we'll see in a moment where he talks about, here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. But see, many times when people get to the place where they can, they have a privilege and they begin to profit from the privilege, they don't realize the influence that they could use for that, that, that place of privilege that they do have. And therefore the, the motivation is often lost for leadership, where somebody's life could be changed or somebody's heart could be stirred or some situation can be radically changed because somebody with position got in there and did something. The leader's too busy positioning himself for more advantages. He said, you know, but I didn't do that. I didn't abuse my position. I didn't abuse my power. I didn't abuse my privilege. I didn't do that. The three, the three things that come, we might say, as a luxury of leadership, 
he didn't abuse. So what's the secret? How, do, how does he maintain his integrity? How does he stay, as you might want to say, above board? How does, he, how does he make the difference? Well, if you follow this through, I think there's three points that he makes as well about those same things. He's, the first thing he says, here's the reason why I did I didn't do it out of reverence for God. First step to protect yourself and your integrity and your position is you realize that God is on the throne and you have a deep reverence for God. We call it the fear of God in the Old Testament. It's the love of God in the New Testament. It's still the same thing. You apprise God above all things. You, you honor God above all things. You respect God more than, than all things. That means I respect God more than I respect people. It means I respect God more than I respect my position. It means that God is at the top of this particular leadership pyramid, and I realize I'm looking up to him. And I realize that he is God and there is no other. I respect God. I fear God. He said, I didn't act like that. Even though everybody before me acted like that, I didn't act like that. In Psalm 75, it talks about David and his leadership, leadership styles and, and how, how, how God moves. And he goes on and he says, you need to understand that, 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 that prominence and, and power come Come, come, don't come from anywhere on the earth, but only from God. It is God who promotes and God who demotes people. So there's, a, there's an understanding that if I'm going to be in a leadership role, I understand that I'm there because God put me there. I think there's two things it means. One is I'm here because I'm, God gave me this position. I'm the father in my family because God gave me that position. I'm the, I'm the husband in this relationship with my wife because God gave me that position. I am where I am by the grace of God. All too often, we think we are where we are by our own intelligence, our own sophistication, our own cleverness, our own personality, or whatever it might be. We think that somehow we've done something to, to advance to the point that we are, and we just declared ourselves to be king. And this is, this is, not, this is not healthy, nor is it realistic. God says that any time I'll raise up a nation, I can tear down a nation. I can demote, I can promote. So I want to realize that I am where I am by the grace of God. And if you're blessed with a place of leadership on your job, in your home, wherever it is, you're there by the grace of God. And I don't understand the sovereignty of God sometimes, nor do I understand the decisions. But God says, I put over the nations the kings that I want and the leaders that I want. For whatever reason, he's doing it. He's still God. And I respect God. And if I'm going to have an integrity in my own life, I'm going to have to maintain a respect for God and hold God in the highest place in my heart and life. Good leaders, godly leaders, spiritual leaders, men of God, women of God who are in leadership positions realize that they're there because God has given them that position and that prominent place. But he holds the keys to promotion and he holds the keys to demotion. And we need to remember that. The second thing to maintain integrity in, in my relationship is this, is I realize that God has not only put me there, he's holding me accountable while I am there. I'm gonna have to account to God that he's the one who I answer to. You know, it's like Reagan used to have on his desk, the buck stops here. There needs to be a clear comprehension in my life, the buck stops here. That I'm not gonna be able to blame anybody. I can't blame my wife, I can't blame the kids, I can't blame my partners at work, I can't blame the boss, I, I can't blame the culture, I can't blame my background and my upbringing. I'm accountable to God. And what I do, God holds me accountable for, all right? He said, you know, I didn't do that because of the fear of the Lord. Scripture says you should walk in that fear. Now, we use the terminology when we've been studying Proverbs, if you remember. In our study on Proverbs, we deal a lot with the fear of the Lord and what the fear of the Lord means. But ultimately, it has to do with a righteous, holy respect and understanding that God is God. Not you, not anybody else, and that we are accountable to that God. And according to the Scripture, from the first of the Bible to the end of the Bible, we're going to have to give an account of ourselves to a holy God. So he says, you want to maintain integrity? He says, listen, I did it out of fear for God. I did because I realized that God's God. I realized that God is on the throne. And I realized that I'm accountable of how I serve God and how I serve others. So as a leader, I'm accountable before the Lord. And I need to understand that accountability. There's a deep, if you look carefully at this passage, there is a deep, awesome respect for God. And it reflects itself in how he models his life and leads his life and leads others in life. The second way we maintain our integrity before the Lord in this regard is we develop a deep love for people. I do not believe, you know, people talk about somebody, well, he's a loving person, he's not a loving person. I don't believe really even that that's a, a, a natural attribute 
Because we are by nature selfish people. And many times when we are a loving person, it's just so I can get something from you. I mean, that's the way the sin nature works. It has a selfish motive. I mean, uh, I mean <laughs> let me put it this way. Think about when you got married. Why'd you date her? Why'd you date him? Well, they made me feel good. You made my point. <laughs> I liked how they made me feel. I liked being around them. It really had a lot to do with yourself. But as you journey in this thing called marriage, you learn it's not about how you, what makes you feel good now. It's about becoming one and serving one another and putting the other person and their feelings and what makes them feel good above what makes you feel good. And what he's saying, is, I, he said, I didn't do it. He said that because I was concerned for the people. All right. The last of verse 17, I didn't do that. What was allotted to the governor for the demands were very heavy on the people. I care about people. I love the people. It's obvious that Nehemiah loved Jerusalem. He loved the city of God and he loved the people of God. All the things he could have done and others had done, he could have gotten away with. He didn't do it because there's something about passion. There's something about a love for others and a love for God. Here he says, instead, I devoted myself in verse 16 to the work of the wall and those that were with me, we devoted ourselves to the work that was on the wall. Remember last week when Tim was preaching, he talked about the famine that was going on and how they, in order to get food, they were mortgaging their land just to have food to buy. And the, those who were in charge would say, you can have food, but give me your land. That wasn't righteous. It wasn't just. People were in need. People were starving. People were hungry. Nehemiah said, I'm not going to operate like that. I'm not going to. In fact, I'm going to discipline myself. I could, but I'm not. Folks, there's a lot of things we could, but we best not. And if we fear the Lord, we won't. If we trust the Lord, we won't. If we believe the Lord, we won't. But that's where integrity comes. And that's where character is issued. That's what happens in the heart. Nobody even may know about your discipline and nobody may know about your sacrifice. They don't know that you went without, but nonetheless, because you fear the Lord and because you love those people, you went without and you suffered on behalf of others. Well, there's never been a greater picture in all of history than that of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe if we're called to places of leadership in our home, in our school, family, wherever it might be on your job, then it requires, if you're going to be an effective leader, if you're going to be an effective person at making a difference in the world you live in, then there's going to be this element of sacrifice that is required on your part. You're going to have to make some decisions to say, I'm not going to take from this. I'm not going to be advantaged here. I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to pay a price. That's not the politicians we serve, that we have serving us today, is it? That's not the world that we know today. It's all about what can I gain from this position that's going to be affect me in a, in a more prosperous way once I leave this particular place. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, he's talking about giving and he's talking about the responsibility of the church to give. And he says at one point in 1 Corinthians, he says, am I not a free man? Am I not an apostle? Am, am I not free to take a wife? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? I, I can do all those things, you know. I, I'm, I'm a child of God. Don't, don't we have the right to food and drink, you know what I'm saying? Don't we have the right to, to, to take a believing wife with us as, as we travel like the other apostles uh, uh, in, in the Lord Jesus and like Cephas did? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? He's appealing to the church saying, listen, we're out there serving the Lord and we're, we're, we're doing it on our own. But you as a church, you need to learn to give. You need to learn to participate in the kingdom of God. You need to, though you can't be on the mission with me, you can make the mission happen. You can send the missionary. When a letter says there are those who, who are called and those who are sent, he said, hey, you can do something. He said, you know, we can take advantage of this, but we don't. But he said, he's demonstrating what genuine leadership. We, we have every right, basically is what he's saying, but we didn't exercise that right. And this is where real leadership is. How often do you have the right to do something, but because you know and you care about people and you respect God, you don't do what you could do. You don't do, I could do a lot of things. I could, but if I did those things, you'd respect the leadership far less. But that's where integrity comes in. And that's where you realize hey, as a leader, as someone who's gonna lead the flock of God or lead the people of God or lead my family or, or, or be a, an influencer in a righteous way at my job, then I'm gonna do without some things. And I'm gonna, I'm going to make some disciplines and have some sacrifices. I'm going to make because there's a greater good at work here. And the glory of God is more important than my satisfaction and my selfishness. But those are lost causes today. And those are those kind of people are very rare anymore. Those kind of leaders are not seen. 
He said, I, I have power and I could use the power, but I'm not going to use it. In fact, I'm not going to abuse it. And I'm not going to use it where I could just to make a difference. Because if I don't use it, not abuse it, but if I don't use it, then I can help somebody else. I could take this, but I'm not. But I think they have a need, so I'm going to give what I could take and I'm going to give it to them. I'm going to do without. I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice in this regard. Because why? I think simply put, he respected the Lord. And it's the second point of great leaders. They love people. You know, I didn't do what the other governors had done. Nehemiah disciplined himself, disciplined himself in every area of life. Moses is a great illustration of this. He's in the palace. He's in Egypt. Second in command in all the nation. Has everything anybody could ever want. He has the palace life, the palace, the, 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 the palace food. He has the palace privilege. He has the, has the palace banquets. He has the palace women. He has all the wealth the world could imagine. All those things are his. But in Hebrews, it says this really stupid statement. What is that? Moses chose to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now that's stupid according to the world. Let's see, suffering, pleasures, suffering, pleasures, suffering, pleasures, pleasures. Let's go pleasures. There's pleasure in sin for a season. Oh, it's sin, sorry, but there's pleasure in sin. Hey, there's fun, there's fun in sin. Nobody would do it if it wasn't fun, right? If it wasn't fun, then I'll think I'll over here. But there is pleasure in sin, but understand, there's a future look. There's a progressive look. There's an outward look that says, hey, whatever I do today, I'm going to pay for tomorrow. Whatever I do today, I'm going to, to, I'm going to have to face tomorrow. There's consequences to my behavior. There's consequences to the way I'm living my life. There's consequences to the things I say. There's consequences to the way I, the way I operate in my life. There's consequences. And I, and they can be righteous or they can be unrighteous. How am I going to live my life? It's the element of discipline in my life, the discipline that says, I want to live with no regrets in my life. I want to move forward in my life so that tomorrow I'm not looking over my shoulder who's fallen, but I get away with that. Did anybody see me? What's going to happen? Where's the emails? You know? Or whatever it might be. I'm free today. I'm free. I don't have to worry about past. I'm not living with those kind of fears in my life. What if they find out what I said? What if they find out what I did? What if they find, hey, and then we live with this cover of sin and darkness in our life because the Bible said men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. But when we go back to the issue of accountability that Nehemiah said, he realizes that God sees all things, darkness and light. There's no such thing as darkness with God. He sees all things that are hidden. So he has this healthy and righteous respect and a fear for God, but he also has this compassion that's demonstrated in a love for, for, for people. And he operates on the basis of that love for people. So what's he doing? He's not focusing necessarily you know, on what he can get. A leader, biblical, righteous, spiritual men and women, young people that are godly and want to make an influence, they don't focus on what they can get or get away with. They focus on how they can contribute. What can I do? How can I make a difference? What can I give? How can I help in this regard? The third thing about keeping your integrity is, in the position we said there was, there was power and position and there's privileges. There, there, there are things that come along with it. As a leader, you usually make more money, right? There's more privileges that come with it. Well, you're going to discipline yourself to realize there are eternal rewards. Not only do I live with this righteous and reverential respect for a holy God, I realize I'm at the stand before that God. And I'm going to have to, you know, look to God and give an account for my life. Many times you said in leadership seminars and classes, they have that leadership pyramid, you know. Well, understand who's at the top of the pyramid. It's God. And you do what you do is the right thing to do, even when nobody else knows what you do, because you know that God is there, and he is not only obviously seeing all that goes on, he's the one who's going to reward what you've done. He said, remember me. He's praying, God, remember me with a favor for what I've done to all and for all these people. Instead of devoting myself to the work on the wall, all, all my men that were assembled there for the work, we did it. And we didn't acquire any land. It wasn't about what we could get out of the deal. Because why? We realize there's a bigger payday coming than right today's payday. There's a bigger reward coming. How many people don't understand the eternal mindset? How many of you are living your life right now in such a narrow view, in such a little closed circle, and you can't see beyond the sunset of today? You don't realize that tomorrow is there. And ultimately, eternity stands beyond that, where we will go into eternity. 
And I will stand before God. And I will give an account of my life there. First account is this. What would you do with Jesus? That's the first account we're all going to get. We, we can't be like Pilate and watch, I don't want to face that and deal with that. We have to be clear and understanding. I made a choice for Jesus Christ or I reject Jesus. If you reject Jesus, your payday is pretty simple. Eternity and judgment in hell. But if you accepted Jesus, then we move on to another level of accountability. What'd you do with Jesus? And then what'd you do with the time and the talent, the treasures that I gave you? What'd you do with the time? What'd you do with your talent? And what'd you do with the treasures? You know, we talk about church leadership. We talk about elders and, and, and deacons and pastors and all those roles. And, you know, we, we, we look at scripture and Titus and Timothy and see all those descriptions about how honorable a man needs to be, how honorable people need to be when they're in leadership roles and, and the accountability that's there before God. And they have to be righteous and good leaders in their home and on and on and on it goes. You know, people kind of think of that like, well, that's that's different kind of Christian, you know. So we'll take those who are in the church who are the different, really good Christians, you know, and we'll make them the leaders because that's what the Bible says. But they hold an attitude, well, since they're not a church leader, those same principles and standards don't apply to them. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, if I was a pastor, I, I think I'd, I'd do that. But God never makes a dual class citizenship kind of thing going on here. We don't have a Christian A and Christian B and you get to choose what you're going to be. Well, I, Christian A, you know, he, he reads the Bible every day. And Christian A, he, he, he ties. I mean, he actually, and he probably gives, he gives to missions on top of all that. And, and, and then he uses his talents for, that's Christian A. And then he uses his time. The guy's in church all the time, you know. And as a ministry, while he's there, he's doing something for other people. Well, that's Christian A. Well, I don't have time for that. So I'll be Christian B. Christian B means I don't have to be like Christian A. Christian B means I come to church when I want. If I don't feel good today, if it's rainy today, if it's cloudy today, if I got a snotty nose, you know, kids got a dirty diaper, I go to church. You messed it up real bad last night. I'm Christian B. I'm Christ, Christian B. I don't have to give like that. I can give whatever I feel like. Christian B says, you know, I can, I can, I can, you know, use my talents as I want to use my talents. Yeah, I could do that for the band, or I could play in the group, or I could teach a lesson, or I could help in the nursery, or I could work with children's church. But I'm not Christian A. That's Christian. I'm Christian B. And so Christian B, there's nowhere in the word of God where you have that dual standard. We're all called to live a righteous life. We're all called to accountability. We're all called to dependability. We're all called to faithfulness in Christ Jesus. You know, there's just nowhere we, we have the, the alternate plan that you get to go by. In fact, that's what Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 when he said, listen, there are those of you who are carnal. And that's because you're little babies in Christ, so that's Okay. He said, but then there are others of you who are yet carnal. Now, in the Greek word language, those are two different words. Where we put in the English just carnal. But in the first word, when he says carnal, I believe it's sarkikos, and that is a word that means you're like little babies because you just got saved, right? So it's all right to be a little baby, all right? It's all right to wet your diaper, all right, when you're a baby. He said, but time has come by now. You should be teaching you are sarkinos, another word we turn translated carnal. But it's a different word in the Greek language. In other words, you've had time to grow, but you're still Christian B. You shouldn't be Christian B. You've been saved a while. You should be growing in grace. You should be, you should be living a, a higher kind of life. You should be making a difference in the world. But Lord, I'm Christian B. I'm not Christian E. Christian A witnesses to his neighbor. I'm just Christian B. It's like, you know, people kind of, we're going to stand before God one day and God's going to ask you if you can't, you're going to say, oh, I'm Christian B. Or hey, my favorite, you know, I, 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 I felt like we'd worked this out. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you know, I, I kind of, I, people ask me, but I said, I've got my own thing going. So I've kind of developed my own thing. I, I kind of looked at what you said, looked at what I wanted, kind of came up with a little compromise. You know, what you said, what I said, what you like, what I like, what you don't like, what I don't like. So I kind of kept my own thing. I got my own thing going, Lord. You know that old country song, me and Jesus got our own thing going? That Christian B. I got it worked out. So I don't have to go to church like that, and I don't have to read my Bible like that, and I don't have to pray like that. And, I, and What a sad day of accountability. 
Don't ever get into your mind that there's two kinds of Christians and that both of them are acceptable in the presence of God. God only accepts one thing. What is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. Well, what's that mean? It means love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. It's pretty clear, is it not? But Christian B doesn't do that. Christian B is concerned with his own time. Lord, I, you know, Christian A is there every Sunday, but hey, I got a soccer game this week, and you know, the God of soccer is important. So, and we got football at 12, so I got to get out of here. And we got baseball on Wednesday night, so, you know, I'm gonna teach, I want my kids to excel in sports. Well, that's good, but I'd rather my kids excel in righteousness. Amen. So you want me to quit the league? I'd find a different league. Amen. Don't look at me like that. I'm your pastor. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, if you want something else, there's other churches, amen. I don't, you don't want to be Christian B because Christian B's got to stand before the Lord one day and receive nothing in eternity. There's something more important than the present and it's the eternal. You and I will stand before God one day where we will get an account of our life and the Bible says we'll receive rewards or we'll lose them. It's amazing that God's got this stash of rewards for you up there and he's ready to give them to you. But if you're going to live like that Christian life, you're just sacrificing daily everything that God has for you in eternity. Eternity, by the way, is a lot longer than what you're going to stay here. So the Bible says you need to store up things in eternity. By the way you live your life, by the deeds you do with your life, by the money you spend in your life, by the talents that God's given you. It's like the guy in Matthew 25, remember? One guy got 10 talents, one guy gets five talents, another guy gets none. One, he takes the one out and he buries it. And his excuse is, oh, I knew what you were like, God. He had no idea what God was like. God said and told him, you knew what I was like, you'd have gone out and invested it at least. For you, sir, if nothing else. Got some chinchy little interest rate on if nothing else. And it says he took it from him. He's only got one. He took it from him. He just has one. He took it from him. And he gave it to them who had 10. The guy who was faithful. The guy who'd been accountable. The guy who realized there's more to live in your life than just right now, there's eternity. That we're all going to stand before God. I'm going to stand there and I'm going to have to give an account for God. Me, myself, and me, and I, both of me. I don't have to give an account. Amen. Arms, yes, sir. Amen. What'd you do with Jesus? The only thing I could. Yes. I gave him a heart to him. What'd you do with your time? What'd you do with your talents? What'd you do with your treasures? Because those are the questions that are asked in the New Testament and, are, and are, are clearly identified to us throughout the Word of God that we're going to be responsible for these things. What did you do with those things? And the word which I want to hear is the same word that he uses in the parable of the talents when he says to his servant who is faithful in what he'd given him, he says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Now there's going to be people in heaven, yes, who don't get rewards. Mark it down. The Bible says, save it, so it's by fire. So what's that mean? I tell you what, I have no idea. But I know this, I don't want to be in heaven without them. <laughs> there must be some benefit. There must be some position. There must be some privilege for having them. If I understand God, he's faithful. And I understand God, he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So I don't want to stand there with nothing to present, nothing to hold, nothing to represent. And I don't think any one of us in this room do. We want to be faithful to the end. So it's leaders who focus on their responsibilities. The loser is the one who just focuses on what I can get away with, or what I can have, or what's mine, or what my rights, this is what I want. Me and I said, I didn't do those things. I could have taken that from you, but I didn't. When you needed food, I gave you food. I didn't take your land for the food. I did what was right. I did what was honorable. I honored the Lord. So we focus not on what we are consider our privileges and rights, but we focus on our responsibility. When Paul writes to the church, he says, to the elders, to the leaders, to the pastors, you shepherd the flock of God that are under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, not because you can get money from it, because you're greedy, but you're eager to serve. Not as lording it over those entrusted you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will not fade away. Any of us in leadership places, and all of us as Christians, are your family, at your church, on your job. We influence. 
And we want to receive a crown of glory that will not fade away, that will bring honor and glory. We'll be tempted to benefit from our position. You may be tempted to benefit from the power you've been given. You may be tempted to benefit from the privileges you've been given, but you're not. You're not. Paul wrote the church, he said, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we're made manifest in your conscience. What's he saying? We're about the business of serving God. We're about the business of being faithful to God. And out of that comes a persuasiveness to men. In one place, Paul says, it's like perfume to God when we're living that kind of life. But we want, to, we want to have a clear conscience and we want to be clear in your conscience that we're here for the glory of God. We're not here to serve ourselves. We're here to serve God. In Hebrews, it says, remember those who led you and spoke the word of God to you. He says, consider the result of their conduct and imitate their faith. He said, take notice of the people around you and let it, be, let it be something that motivates you and let it cause you to be the same kind of person where you lead in your life. Imitate, follow, imitate their faith. See what their conduct was like. All to, today, today we have too many people in places in our mind that we think are in privilege and position and authority, but they're not godly and they're not righteous and they're making no real difference in the world around them, not only in the present or in the eternal. That's why the scripture tells us, hey, you consider these people and you remember these people and you see how they live their life when true leadership comes. Listen, we have responsibilities, every one of us in this room, pastor or not pastor. I don't, I don't like the word layman. I guess they call them, I don't know why they call them layman. Maybe they lay down, I don't know. <laughs> Everyone's have a responsibility to live a, a godly life. And in the end, I mean, when you and I, I mean, just picture yourself standing before the Lord in this moment. What do you want to hear? I don't want to hear tisk, tisk, tisk. <laughs> arms, arms, arms. You. How could you make such a mess? <laughs> I want to hear well done. Yes. Yes. You could have taken advantage, you could have abused. You could have misused your place as a father, but you didn't. You could have misused your place as a husband, but you didn't. You could have misused your place in the church, but you didn't. You could have, and go down that list. I don't want to hear that. You could have misused your talents, your treasure. None of us want to hear that, do we? I think the deep cry, longing of every one of our hearts, if we truly know Christ, is to say, we want to hear, well done. You've done good. You've done good. Come on into the joy of the Lord. Isn't that what you want to hear? But if, I, if I'm going to settle for Christian B's life, I'm not going to hear that. God's calling us higher. God's calling us another step up. We, we should always be hearing that call, the call to, to more, the call to higher, the call to greater, the call, you know, upwards, onwards, keep coming, keep coming, keep drawing near, keep, keep moving forward. The reason I preach like I preach, because I know that when I preach like this, I'm held accountable for what I've said. And it causes me to want to reach more. The reason we need to be in a church with people like this who hold us accountable, who care about us, who love us is because it keeps moving us forward. Last thing we need. The last thing we need look there, is friends and people who don't care, who don't hold us accountable, who don't encourage us, who don't prompt us, who don't fuss at us when we need it. We need faithful, true friends. Let's stand with our heads bowed.